Did Pope Francis change the church's teaching on the sacrament of marriage in a more satizia? Stick around to find out. You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, welcome back to Reason in Theology. Your host, Michael Lofton. We are doing a review of Amor Satitia, a, a show that I've promised for a while now, but I've finally had the opportunity to sit down and prepare a presentation on it. So that is what we are going to do today. We're asking, did Pope Francis change the teaching of the church on the sacrament of marriage with the Mors Atitia? Has the discipline changed? Stuff like that. How does this work out with the dubia? How does this work out with the uh, guidelines by the uh, Buenos Aires bishops? We're going to answer all of those things today. <sighs> Strap in for a lengthy show. Uh, I have about 50 slides that I prepared today. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of ground to cover here. And believe me, this is not, not exhaustive. Let me go ahead and silence this. This is not exhaustive by any means. Um, but I do hope that it is a thorough treatment of the question. Again, not exhaustive, but thorough. All right. Let me share my screen here and let's get started. Okay. There we go. Y'all should be able to see that. Amor Satizia, a change in church teaching? Question mark. All right, let's do, let's go over an outline here. So first I'm going to go over introductory remarks. Then I am going to go over an examination of Amor Satizia. Uh, most of the paragraphs of Amor, I'm going to give a summary for the vast majority of them. Then I'm going to go over the Buenos Aires Bishops' Guidelines, approved by Pope Francis. I will then go over the dubia, submitted by four cardinals in the Catholic Church to Pope Francis. I will then go over a response to the dubia. Um, and then I will go over the Council of Trent on the indissolubility of marriage. And then I will offer some concluding remarks okay so with introductory rem remarks what is a more satizia well this is a post synodal apostolic exhortation on april 20, uh, 2016 what is post synodal exhortation well this is a document that is usually released by the pope um after a synod which is a group of um, bishops and sometimes cardinals, it's a group of advisors that the Pope calls from different parts in the world and brings them uh, together to go over a particular topic, and then they offer him advice on something, and then he will look over their report, and he may or may not issue a post-synodal exhortation, which again, looks at what they advised, and then he offers his thoughts, and he promulgates it as Pope. So it is magisterial. The post-synodal apostolic exhortation is magisterial, not, not necessarily what the bishops, you know, advise to them. Uh, but it's a helpful thing because, I mean, you, you want your Pope to be informed. So the idea is certainly helpful. So that's what this is. And this was, again, released 2016. As far as my former view on Amor Satizia, when it was originally released, um, that's when I really started looking into Eastern Orthodoxy. I had to just say, look, I think that this is a defeater for Catholicism. I felt like Amor Satizia just goes too far, it does too much damage to the papal magisterium to where it, it, it just shows that it's morally certain that the papacy has been invalidated. Uh, so I just said, okay, I, you know, this is unreasonable. I'm going to start looking elsewhere. Um, however, you know, after having years to reflect um, on the issue of Mors Laetitia, I adopt a very different perspective on it. But that was my former perspective. So I certainly understand people who would 
uh, have the impression that somehow the church's teaching has changed or something's going on with the more satitia that is contrary to the papal claims. I, I can understand why they would have that impression because I used to be there. Uh, but I've, I've, I've learned a lot since then, and I hope to offer some of what I've learned here. Um, I will note that Amor Satitia is often used as an excuse for dissent. So I'm hoping to help put an end to that. I have no uh, expectation to really putting an end to any kind of dissent. But um, I, I know some people are going to still dissent from Amor Satitia no matter what is said. But what I'm saying is I hope to help uh, curve that. I hope to help with those who have an open mind, who are willing to consider a more satsitsia, I hope they'll see, okay, this isn't a, an occasion for me to dissent from the papal magisterium. But again, unfortunately, often in many cases, it's used kind of as, a, um, as an excuse that people hang over the head of Pope Francis to dissent from his magisterium or from the papacy in general. I've heard Catholics use it. I've heard Eastern Orthodox use it. I've, heard, I've, I've even heard, you know, Protestants use this as somehow a blight against the papacy. So some might say, Pope Francis teaches heresy in a more Laetitia, therefore I resist him. Or they'll say something like, or therefore he's not the Pope. Or Pope Francis changed the teachings of the Council of Trent on divorce and remarriage, therefore insert whatever position they want to maintain. Again, it's often used as an excuse for dissent. That's not to say that some people aren't sincerely um, uh, confused about Amor Satitia. Sure, absolutely. But in some cases, I think some people have not actually really tried to look into Amor Satitia. They just kind of use it as an excuse to dissent. Uh, let's briefly just talk about the difference between a teaching and a discipline, because this is certainly important here. Um, if we're talking about has the church's teaching changed, of course, what, what exactly is a teaching? A teaching is going to be a proposition that one must adhere to. Now, these are my definitions. These are the working definitions that I'm using. Maybe um, uh, maybe if, if you uh, think that, okay, that's not really a good definition, fine, get, give me another definition. But for now, this is the working definition that I'm using, and I think it will, it will suffice, for, at least for our purposes. And we, we might tweak that. Uh, a, a little bit, um, uh, but I think that'll work for now. And the discipline, again, my, my definition here, I think it, it will work for our purposes, but feel free to tweak it. A discipline is an application of a teaching in concrete circumstances. That, that's the working definition that I'm using. And any kind of other definition that I think a person would offer for a teaching or discipline, I don't think would really substantially differ from this. So again, even if you kind of tweak it or you, you have a little discrepancy with it, I don't think that's really going to change the substance of what I'm presenting here or my working definition. Um, what is a dogma? This is, of course, going to be important because when we speak about the Council of Trent's teaching on the indissolubility of marriage or when we just speak about the indissolubility of marriage, period, um, we, we are... Um, generally in agreement that this is going to be dogmatic. So what is a dogma? Dogma is something that is taught by uh, divine revelation. So it's taught in sacred scripture and it's confirmed by the church as something taught in scripture. So the church has either solemnly or in its ordinary and universal magisterium definitively uh, proposed this as something uh, revealed by God. So that's effectively what a dogma is. Um, and what is heresy? Well, it's going to be the denial of a dogma for somebody who has been baptized. It's either the obstinate denial or it's going to be, um, uh, you know, somebody who's putting it into doubt and, and really obstinately doubting it. Okay. So that's going to be important if we're asking, you know, does Amor Satitia teach heresy or something like that? <clears throat> it's important that we, we define our terms. Okay. So as far as an overview of Amor Satitia, chapter 8 specifically, because Amor Satitia is a really long document, <laughs> um, and it has all kinds of things that it says about marriage, but it's usually chapter 8 that's kind of ground zero for these discussions. It's, it's chapter 8 that addresses the question of people who are divorced and remarried. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of most of the paragraphs in, um, in chapter eight. Okay. 
So paragraph 291, where it starts, uh, this is not a direct quote. So if you don't see quotation marks, it's it's me summarizing it. Um, it, it, it. It effectively communicates that any breach against the marriage bond is against the will of God. And that's really important to note up front. It's very careful to note up front that it affirms the tradi traditional teaching of the church and that any deviation from that is sinful. It's very careful to note that. So again, any breach against the marital bond, according to Amor Satisia, is against the will of God. For those in this situation, the church accompanies them while calling them to a fuller response to God. So there's this constant repetition throughout the document about how the church is to call them to obey God's will and to offer a fuller response. If they deviate from God's will, they deviate from the ideal of the sacrament of marriage, call them back to it. The document emphasizes that over and over and over. It's the church's duty, yes, to accompany them, yes, to be merciful, but to call them to the fullness of the truth and for God's will for their life. Okay, paragraph 292. Marriage is between a man and a woman. It is until death and is open to life. So it's very careful to explain what marriage is. And that then tells you what marriage is not. Uh, some unions contradict it, it, notice, it, it notes um, this. Some unions contradict what marriage is. Same-sex unions, for, for instance. And some only partially realize it. Perhaps those who are civilly remarried, um, but there will, they, they did not receive a sacramental uh, union. And, and perhaps maybe both of them were baptized Catholics. So they, they had a duty to go and receive um uh, their their marriage through the church and not through the state. That's just one example. There, there could be many others. Now, paragraph 295. John Paul II's law of gradualness is discussed. What is this law of gradualness? This law is defined as a process whereby one, quote, knows, loves, and accomplishes moral good by different stages of growth, in quote. So it's this idea that you're, you're on your way to achieving the fullness of what God requires of you morally. But that could happen through a process. You, you can, you're, you're open to the fullness of what God expects of you, but we often know it generally, well, <laughs> I say generally, it sometimes doesn't happen immediately. Those of us who struggle with sin, uh, sometimes we choose to do the wrong thing. Um, but we're open to following God, but it might be a process. So again, it's a process where one knows, loves, and accomplishes moral good, but different stages of growth. They're progressing and intending to eventually achieve that the fullness of what God expects of them. It has a discussion about this because that's certainly relevant to people who are in situations of uh, divorce and, and have been remarried. Paragraph 296, the church is to be merciful to those who ask for mercy. It gives a quote here, the way of the church is not to condemn anyone forever. Notice the uh, context here is the church is not to condemn anyone forever. It is to pour out the balm of God's mercy on those who ask for it with a sincere heart. So you're not to judge a person, do penance until death. Even in the early church, they would generally, if you were on your deathbed, even if you have not completed your penance, they would generally on your deathbed go ahead and give you Holy Communion. Now, they might wait until you're on your deathbed in some cases, but when you got to your deathbed, they would go ahead and show you mercy and give you Holy Communion in the, in the vast majority of cases. They wouldn't condemn you forever. That is the church. would not not condemn you forever. Maybe God will. Maybe, maybe if you're unrepentant, maybe God will separate you or you will separate yourself from him for eternity and you're condemned forever. But the church won't because it's not the church's duty to judge in that way. The church is to be open to those who are sincere, and they have a sincere heart, and they're um, 
asking for mercy. This is important because in the very next paragraph, it contains a phrase that is distorted by some even unto this day all over YouTube. There's a quote where it says, no one can be condemned forever because that is not the logic of the gospel. And they'll say, heresy! Pope Francis is teaching heresy! That's a denial of hell, and that's a denial of the eternity of hell. And Yeah, you've heard it a million times. Except the previous paragraph told you the context was, quote, the way of the church is not to condemn anyone forever. It's talking about the church, not God sending someone to hell for eternity. It's talking about the church. You're not to make a person do penance the rest of their life, and when they're on their deathbed, you, you don't give them communion. You just say, sorry, good luck. No, that's not the right way to do it. No one can be condemned forever. That phrase there, again, has to be understood in the context of the church. It says absolutely nothing to do with whether or not a person can be condemned by God forever. So anybody that you see distorting this message and accusing Pope Francis of heresy, dismiss that person as an unreliable source. Dismiss them because they're not looking at the immediate context. Dismiss that person, they're unreliable. All right, paragraph 297. Still talking about the same paragraph here. Flaunting or teaching something imperfect or sinful as the ideal is contrary to the church's teaching, and it separates one from the community of Christ. So if there's somebody who's flaunting their same-sex lifestyle, somebody who's flaunting fornication or cohabitation, as if this is something that is okay in God's sight, that's contrary to the church's teaching according to Amor Satitia, and it separates them from the community of Christ. They need to have a conversion, according to Amor Satitia. They need to change. They need to repent. They need to embrace the gospel. Amor Satitia is clear on that. So you can't go around flaunting your sin and thinking like, this, this is okay, God accepts this. No. Repent of your sins. Such people need conversion, again, according to Amor Satitia. It's nice in the way it says it. I mean, they're not, they're not being me, but, but they are giving you that hard truth that, yeah, these people need to be converted. They're wrong. It puts it in a nice way, though. <laughs> paragraph 297. Still the same paragraph. In the case of the divorced and remarried, the church has the duty to help them understand the truth. So one of the duties of the church is to help them understand the truth about their situation and about what God expects from them and about what the teaching is of the church is and assist them in embracing the fullness of God's plan for them, which is always possible by the Holy Spirit. So it's very careful to note one of the duties of the church, help them understand the truth, help them see if they're living in sin, and help them to realize the, the fullness of God's plan for their life, to get out of that sin. And it notes this is always possible by the Holy Spirit. This means it is the duty of the church to call them to the truth, and it's not impossible for them to embrace God's will for their life, of course, by grace. We're not Pelagians. But guess what that means? It means they misrepresent the Pope those who say that Pope Francis denies the Council of Trent's teaching that the requirements of the law are possible to be carried out by God's grace. The Council of Trent talks about how it's possible for us to carry out God's law by His grace. There were some reformers saying otherwise. It's impossible to obey what God commanded. Well, the Council of Trent condemned that. And some will say, but you know what? Pope Francis and Amor Satitia, he's denying what Trent says there. Quite the contrary, paragraph 297 recognizes that by God's grace, one is to embrace God's will for their life. So he's, he's not contradicting the Council of Trent. I'm skipping to paragraph 302, but I'm going to go back and talk to about 298, 299, 301 in just a moment. I'm skipping to it because I, I want to get some um, 
I'm going to get to the part where they're talking about uh, reduction in culpability to make a little bit more sense of the other paragraphs that we're going to look at. So that's why I'm skipping real quick to 302, and then I'm going to go back. So Morris Letizia appeals to the Catechism of the Catholic Church to note that there are situations that could reduce a person's personal culpability. And, and we all know this, right? Um, the Catechism notes imputability and responsibility for an action can be diminished or even nullified by ignorance, inadvertence, duress, fear, habit, inordinate attachments, and other psychological or social factors. Notice that one, social factors. That's, that's actually going to be important later. But the Catechism already recognizes this idea. Um, a, a person may commit an act that is grave matter, but it doesn't mean they're automatically guilty of a mortal sin because it could be that they don't have full knowledge or full consent of the will. There could be factors that reduce or mitigate their culpability, and these are just some recognized by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it mentions that. It then mentions another aspect of the Catechism where it talks about this reduction. Um, it says, effective immaturity, force of acquired habit, conditions of anxiety, or other psychological or social factors that lessen or even extenuate moral, culpab moral culpability. With one or more of these factors present, a person in a situation, well, let me ask the question, is a person in a situation of divorce and remarriage truly guilty of mortal sin? If one of those or even more are present, are they truly guilty of mortal sin if they're in a situation of remarriage when their previous union was valid and let's say they engage in the marital act? If one of those factors is present, are they guilty of mortal sin? Well, the answer is going to have to be no. No. Okay, so if not, could some people in this situation be admitted to communion? Now, it's not asking you this question in, in, in Amor Sensitia, paragraph 302. This is more me asking and pointing it out. If there's a reduction in culpability for a particular person, given their circumstances, could they receive Holy Communion? Well, what bars you from Holy Communion in the Catholic Church? What excludes someone from re reception of communion? If someone is in a state of mortal sin, now might you still say that, well, even, even if you don't have full consent and full knowledge, you should still go and confess it. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody's disputing that. But the question is, would you still, however, be able to receive communion if you don't confess something that, yes, it's grave matter, but you did not have full consent of the will? You're, you maybe plan on confessing it, but maybe you go to the liturgy and there's communion there. Could you receive Holy Communion if you had those mitigating circumstances to where it's now reduced to a venial sin? It's not a mortal sin on your part. Well, yes, actually, you, you could. You could. But yeah, you still need to go and confess it whenever you go to confession. But, could, but should you be excluded from communion in that case? No. So keep that in mind. Now, going back to paragraph 298, the church recognizes cases where one cannot leave their current union without creating new sins. It starts to talk about particular circumstances where somebody, um, you know, perhaps they've been abandoned by their previous spouse, and so they now have entered into a new union. And, you know, they, they come and to the Catholic Church and they see, okay, well, look, I'm, I'm not in the right situation. Um, it seems like maybe my previous union may have been married. Uh, I'm sorry, may have been valid. Um, but now I have new children in this new union. Uh, per if I were to leave this new union, might that create some new sins? It, it starts to talk about situations like this. Um, it, it addresses the fact that some will respond to a scenario like this and say, um, <clears throat> and yeah, I see, Dr. DeClue, I see what you say about grave sin, not mortal. I'll, I'll address that later. Um, 
But it says some will respond with John Paul II's apostolic exhortation familiaris consortio. Uh, but but I would say um, when when I read the Code of Canon Law there about grave sin, I understand that to be um, not just grave matter, but actually whenever full knowledge and full consent is present. If you're saying that a person has to uh, go to confession first if they've committed an act that is merely grave matter, but not full knowledge and full consent, and because of that they can't receive Holy Communion, I, I, I think that that's, that's incorrect, but I'm, I'm willing to stand corrected. Um, if that's the case, although n nothing that I'm going to say here ultimately hinges on that. There's other um, other things that Amor said since is addressing, but that that is one of the points that I'll bring out here. I don't understand the Code of Canon Law to say that you would be excluded from communion if this act is grave matter, but you don't have full knowledge and full consent. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we, can, we, we can talk about that a little bit more later during Q&A. Uh, so, okay. Some will respond with John Paul II's apostolic exhortation familiaris consortio, paragraph 84, and say that such people should live as brother and sister. In other words, they shouldn't act on any kind of physical intimacy if they're in this situation. So they're, they're in a new union, they have children together, so it might create more problems if they were to separate at that point. It, it would create especially problems for the children. Um, in that case, John Paul II was saying in Familiaris Consortio, they, they should live as brother and sister. And if they're living as brother and sister, then, you know, as long as it doesn't create scandal, they can receive Holy Communion. So Amoris Letitia actually responds to this point about Familiaris Consortio 84. It responds to this and says, in some cases such as these, living as brother and sister may lead them to a situation that the good of the children suffers. So there could be some cases that if they were to live as brother and sister, that would actually create more problems for the children. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Maybe you disagree with my example. That's fine. It doesn't give you any examples. But I'm just going to give you one that I've, I've come up with. Consider a formerly Catholic wife who reverts to paganism and says that if she does not receive physical intimacy from her husband in this new union, then she will divorce him and take the children away. If she were to take the children, it's very likely the mother will receive custody. And as a result, she'll have greater influence on the children than the Christian father. And... You know, some might say, well, this is a rare circumstance. Just wait. I'll address that in a moment. Another example. A husband who is abandoned by his ex-wife and, and who will have little moral influence on the upbringing of his most recent child unless he marries the mother of the child. So, you know, maybe he's in a situation where he... Um, committed the sin of fornication, but, you know, they now have a child together. And if he doesn't marry this person, he's going to have little more influence on them. Um, might that impact issues of validity and stuff like that? <laughs> Look, I, I understand that, but we're already talking about something that's not a sacramental marriage. Was it wrong for him to have married the mother? We can maybe have that discussion, but let's say he, he, he still goes and, and marries her. If so, now that he is civilly married... Should he abandon the children at this point? Let's say he realizes, okay, this was this, you know, I my my previous marriage is actually valid or something like that. Should he now abandon his children? Um, some are gonna say, well, do the do the brother and sister thing. Okay, well, what if the brother and sister situation doesn't work for the reason I just mentioned? What if the wife is saying, Look, unless you give me physical intimacy, I, I'm I'm leaving you. I'm gonna take the children. Can he then go to confession and then receive the Eucharist? So can he go to confession if he knows that he's not going to be able to entirely avoid the marital act with his spouse because of her pressure? I'm not saying that it, this makes it right or not sinful. I'm not saying that. The question, however, is, 
can he go to confession and confess that, and then after confession, go and receive the Eucharist? It's an important question, because some people are going to say, no, you don't have a firm pur purpose of amendment. We'll address that in a little bit. But is the man's consent of the will in this situation, by the way, fully present in these acts such that they would result in mortal sin? It sounds like his wife is kind of pressuring him. Could that not actually reduce some of his culpability? It might not eliminate his culpability. Nobody's arguing that. But is it possible that it, actually some of his culpability could be reduced? These may be rare cases. And these are examples that I've come up with. Maybe they're not good examples. Maybe you should throw these examples out. They're just my examples. But may, maybe you can come up with some better ones. But I say these may be rare cases. But Amor Satitia is focusing on the rare cases, not all cases. It's focusing on the rare cases, not all cases. So you say, these are rare cases, that's the point. It's already addressed the majority of people need to repent and go back to their previous use. It's already addressed those things. But in rare cases, could there be a reduction of culpability in certain circumstances? That's what it's talking about. And it also does not make the exception the rule. So when we talk about these rare cases and exceptions, it's certainly careful um, to note that that's not the rule. All right, so paragraph 298. This paragraph also addresses cases where one may have a subjective moral certitude that their previous marriage was invalid, but they have not yet received a declaration of nullity, which is an annulment. Maybe there, there are some impediments in obtaining this declaration of nullity. Now, fortunately, Pope Francis has actually expedited the process, eliminating some of these issues. But I could still foresee a person who they haven't been able to actually get that declaration of nullity, but there's a moral certitude that the previous union was invalid. Some are going to say, that's not good enough. You know, you got to get the declaration of nullity. Others are going to say, no, in some rare circumstances, this moral certitude could actually open the door for that person to receive Holy Communion, even if they're in a new union. Or at the very least, go to confession and then receive communion. Uh, paragraph 299. Divorced and remarried need to be more integrated into the church while avoiding any scandal in doing so. So it's talking about the people who are divorced and remarried. They do need to be re they need to be integrated into the life of the church. Maybe not um, with reception of the sacraments in all cases, but there does need to be more integration that spurs them on to repentance and spurs them on to uh, greater unity with the church so that they don't despair. But it needs to be done in a way that avoids scandal in doing so. That's very important. In a way that would avoid any kind of scandal. Paragraph 300. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, it notes. Rather, there are different approaches to difficult situations according to various levels of culpability and responsibility. And it then notes that priests have the duty to help the divorced and remarried to understand the teaching of the church on marriage. So it's not like we're just ignoring what the church teaches. Priests have the duty to help people who are living in these situations to understand the teaching of the church and God's will for their life. An examination of conscience is also then offered for the divorce and remarriage. It's actually a very helpful examination of conscience, especially for those who were active in destroying their previous marriage. Very helpful. Then it talks about how accompanying the divorced and remarried cannot leave out the demands of truth and charity. So any kind of relativism excluded. Truth and love is still demanded. <clears throat> uh, Joe, I see you there in the chat. Hold on your questions and, until the end. I'll be happy to answer them then. 
All right. Paragraph 300. Uh, continue with it. The process of accompaniment must include a willingness to follow God's will and respond to it. So whenever we're talking about, a pro, you know, the church accompanying people, um, you know, helping them with God's mercy and being merciful to them and trying to help them understand the truth of what God expects of them, this process is to still tell a person, look, you, you need to be willing and open to following God's will and its ideal in your life. In other words, let's say you're a priest and you're you're trying to help people who are struggling with this situation and they're in this situation of, you know, being divorced and remarried. Whatever you're doing with them as far as accompaniment, whatever you're doing and trying to help them uh, understand God's will for their life, the priests really need to emphasize the fact that they need to remain open to following God's will for them. And here it's talking about the ideal. They, they can never just come and say, you know what, I, I'm, I just, I don't accept that. I just don't accept what the church teaches. That's not an openness and openness and a willingness to follow God's will and respond to it. No, the priest needs to encourage them in that case, no, re repent of your sins. And you, and you need to be open to following God. It talks about how the grave danger, and it speaks about that that in those words, the grave danger that any priest can quickly grant exceptions is to be avoided. Paragraph 301, not all living in irregular unions are automatically immortal sin, as there could be mitigating factors that would reduce such a state. Again, there could be mitigating factors here that would mean they're not in mortal sin. Uh, is, is there a debate on whether or not you have to go to confession first? Okay, even if, even if that's the case. The point is, Amor Sititia is very careful to note the sacrament of reconciliation is available to them and never actually indicates that they should receive the Eucharist without uh, the sacrament of reconciliation. So even if there is a reduction uh, of culpability and they're not in mortal sin, it never says that they shouldn't go to confession. In fact, it constantly asserts that they should. Um, ignorance, however, can also reduce culpability. Being aware of something doesn't mean, by the way, that one understands it. And when we're talking about ignorance and the dispelling of ignorance, we're, we're really more talking about somebody really understanding it. Um, let me give you an example. Whenever we discovered the new world, we had some people who would go to the new world and they were doing all kinds of scandalous things, but then they were also preaching the gospel to the Native Americans while also doing scandalous things in front of them. Some of our theologians said, okay, well, when we do these scandalous things in front of them, but then we preach the gospel to them, does, and, and let's say the Native American isn't convinced. <laughs> Does that mean they're no longer ignorant? And our theologians were very careful to note, no, not exactly, because just hearing something doesn't necessarily mean that ignorance has been dispelled. It needs to be convincing. So simply hearing what the church says doesn't necessarily dispel ignorance. It's, it's more understanding it. That's really what is dispelling ignorance. So some somebody might hear that, okay, well, divorce and remarriage, that's a sin. Does that necessarily mean they understand it? Not exactly. So do, does that necessarily mean just because they've heard it, they're, they're not still ignorant? Could be that there's still an element of ignorance there. And in that case, could that actually reduce culpability? It's possible. Amoris Letizia does give you other examples. Those were just my examples. Amoris also points out certain cases where one may have a reduction in the consent of the will. And here Aquinas is referenced. So there, there, there could be reduction due to ignorance. There could also be a reduction um, due to one's consent of the will. That, that could also be mitigated. And again, Aquinas is referenced for this. By the way, Thomas Aquinas is, and the Summa Theologica is, is mentioned constantly in chapter 8. In fact, it's really the work of Aquinas that um, they're, they're 
attributing this position to in chapter eight too. They they're really they they present it as really the product of his theology. Paragraph three hundred three. Every effort should be made to help one properly form their conscience and trust in God's grace. So it's it's noting about how um, one is to properly form their conscience. They're they're not to just you know remain in ignorance. They have a duty to form their conscience. And also to trust in God's grace to, to do what he requires of them. They're not to say, oh, I, I can't do this. This is too hard for me. No, they're to trust in God's grace. This may mean that one recognizes what the gospel demands, which is repent, right? Repent of your sins. It could also mean one responds to what God requires of someone, even when it is not the ideal. Now, how can God call someone to something that is less than God's ideal standard? That's, I'm sure, what people are going to ask at this point. Um, it does not give an example, so I, I just come up with one. God calls all to be free from idolatry, but Elijah, the prophet Elijah, presumably with God's blessing in Scripture, allowed Naaman to bow to an idol without the intention to worship the idol. Now, we, we think, wait, what? <laughs> he allowed him to do what? <laughs> that Yeah, that, that's in the Bible. Go over to 2 Kings 5, 18 through 19. Here's what it actually says. This is Naaman speaking. Go and read the whole chapter for the context. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Elisha says to him, go in peace. And there's no condemnation of scripture like Elijah, what he said to him is wrong. It, it gives you the impression as, as if this, this was a good thing. Go in peace. Don't be troubled in your conscience over this because you're not intending idolatry. But the action there is contrary to his intent, Right. Yes, but in this case, the prophet says, go in peace due to your circumstances. Ordinarily, no. But in this case, because of your particular uh, situation, that's permitted as long as you're not intending idolatry in your heart. I would also say consider the difference between God's antecedent and consequent will. Maybe that plays a factor in here. This is, again, me spitballing. That's not the document. Take it or leave it. Take, take it or leave, you know, take it or leave it when it comes to my example there with name it. Maybe you don't agree. Okay. Maybe it's a bad argument. Okay. That's just my argument. Um, again, the distinction between antecedent and consequent will made famous by um, uh, John of Damascus. Well, of course, it's, it's, it's something biblical, but he, he really uh, explicates it and, and talks about it explicitly. Um, this is the idea that God's antecedent will is going to be, for example, God desires for everyone to be saved. But God's consequent will would be that, but he, but he still allows for some to be damned, right? Um, consequent to what? Consequent to people sinning. God desires for those people to be saved, but he knows because of some of their actions, he can allow them to be damned. So that's going to be the distinction between antecedent and consequent will. Might that play a factor here? And God calling to someone to something less than ideal provisionally? Perhaps. But one should always remain open to further growth and realizing God's ideal standard, according to the document. All right. Paragraph 304, it is not enough to ask what is God's general rule on a subject. One must also ask, what does God require of someone in a particular case, in a particular instance? Aquinas is invoked to bring out this distinction. It quotes him. Although there is, a, although there is necessity in the general principles the more we descend to matters of detail, the more frequently we encounter defects. In matters of action, truth or practical rectitude is not the same for all. 
as to matters of detail, but only as to the general principles. And when there is the same rectitude of matters of detail, it is not equally known to all. The principle will be found to fail accordingly as we descend further into detail. And in the same part, Aquinas gives us an example that, that kind of explains what he just said. And it's, and it's backing up what they're saying in paragraph 303. I'm sorry, 304. In the same part of the Summa, Aquinas gives this example. If someone is entrusted with someone else's goods, there's a general principle that one should return those goods to their owner upon their owner's request. If you're, you're holding somebody's items for them and they ask them back for you, there, there's a general principle that says you're, you should give that back to them because they're the rightful owners to it, not you. However, that's the general principle. There are some specific principles that could actually negate that. In the case when these goods would be used to fight against one's own country, this rule does not apply. So there, there is this general principle that you're re to return the goods to their rightful owner. But what if those goods are going to be used to fight your own country or to murder your own children? <laughs> to get really exaggerated in this example, right? They're going to use, you're holding their gun for them. They get out of jail. <laughs> they say, before they go to jail, they say, here, hold my gun for me. You hold their gun for them. They're the rifle owner. They get out of jail and they say, look, I need my gun back. I'm going to kill your family. What? I'm not giving you that gun back. <laughs> There's a general principle that, that you should return to them what belongs to them, but not if it's going to then do that. I mean, now you have an obligation to protect your family. That's what it's referring to here when it's saying it's not enough to really ask what's God's general rule here with marriage. The question now is also, but what is God requiring in this particular circumstance? So likewise, it's true that one should live as brother and sister with their new spouse if they are divorced and the previous union is valid, that's true. However, in rare cases, one may find themselves in a situation where carrying out the general rule would violate other rules, giving their particular circumstances. This is not a denial of God's ability and God's grace to carry out his commands, but it's a recognition that in some cases, carrying out God's general commands may cause other sins and may not consider other things that God requires of them in a particular case. That's the point. However, these exceptions may not be elevated to a general rule, obviously. Okay, uh, paragraph 305. If there are mitigating factors present, someone who is objectively in a sinful situation may be able to receive the church's help through the sacrament. And here comes footnote 351 that everybody talks about. Footnote 351 is then provided to substantiate this. Talking about, again, in mitigating circumstances, the sacraments are available to help the person. It says in footnote 50, 351, I want to remind priests that the confessional must not be a torture chamber. So we're talking about confession here, but rather an encounter with the Lord's mercy. And then it goes on to say, I would also point out that the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. So it's talking about confession and the Eucharist. It's talking about both. Note, the footnote is in the context of those who do not have full knowledge or full consent. It's talking about people with mitigating factors who are not in mortal sin. It might be grave matter, but it's not mortal sin because of a mitigating circumstance. So note the footnote is in that context, which would mean their sins are venial, not mortal. People who are in venial sins are able to receive confession and or the Eucharist. Again, there's going to be a debate on, well, but you, you, you must go first even if it's only grave matter, even if you don't have full consent. Well, even if you do take that position, which I'm not necessarily saying I agree with, but I could understand how somebody might read canon law that way when it talks about you have an obligation to confess grave sins before reception of communion. 
I can see how somebody would read it that way. But even so, people who are in venial sin are able to receive confession according to this paragraph. So this is within the bounds of orthodoxy. And this is really the key, I think, to the whole controversy, the question of footnote 351. This is the key here, because everybody kind of hangs their hat on, on uh, footnote 351. But footnote 351 is literally what I uh, just quoted to you. Note the footnote does not say all divorced and remarried people may receive the Eucharist without confession. Note the footnote does not say anyone may receive the Eucharist without confession. It does not say that. It does not say these people with mitigating factors, you're able to go just straight to the sacrament of confession, uh, to, to the Eucharist. You don't need to go to confession. It never says that. It mentions confession and mentions the Eucharist. Might you make a case that if they have those mitigating circumstances, they could go straight to the Eucharist and could just confess it later? I think you can make that case. But even if I'm wrong on that, irrelevant because paragraph or footnote 351 never says that you go straight to the Eucharist without confession. In fact, it mentions confession first. Note the footnote does not contradict the church's teaching on the indissolubility of the sacrament of marriage. Note the foot does not deny that one should strive to achieve God's ideal plan for their life. Again, this is the footnote that many hang their hat on and claim that the document denies the church's teaching or practically opposes the church's teaching on the sacrament. Neither are true. Paragraph 307. The Pope emphasizes in order to avoid all misunderstanding that the church must propose the full ideal of marriage and that this should not be desisted in any way. So again, once again, we have the obligation, propose the full ideal, and that should not be resisted. It notes a lukewarm attitude, any kind of relativism, or an undue reticence in proposing that ideal, would be a lack of fidelity to the gospel and also of love on the part of the church for young people themselves. It's not loving to hide the truth from someone. To show understanding in the face of exceptional situations never implies dimming the light of the fuller ideal or proposing less than what Jesus offers to the human being. That's important. Because isn't that exactly how people um, portray Amor Satitia? Like it's a weakening of the church's teaching? Paragraph 311. Far from relativizing mercy, the document notes mercy is not opposed to justice and truth. It says, quote, It is true, for example, that mercy does not exclude justice and truth. But, <coughs> but it says, but first and foremost, we have to say that mercy is the fullness of justice and the most radiant manifestation of God's truth. Is it maybe giving a primacy to mercy? Sure. But not to the exclusion of justice and truth. Footnote 364 then comes up here. It talks about the possibility of a new fall in sin does not mean that one does not have a firm purpose of amendment in the sacrament of reconciliation. Monumental. That's important. Because a huge controversy here is going to be, well, for these some of these people who are in this new union and they're not living as brother and sister, can I really give them absolution as a priest? Can I really accept and hear their confession? Can I really do that? If if they if I if I know that tomorrow he and his wife, for example, or the wife and the husband, whatever, in the new union are going to engage in the marital act. And this is this is only a civil marriage, uh, but there's no declaration of nullity, so there's a uh presumably a bond to a previous marriage. You know, if, if there's if if they know they're going to fall in sin the next day or something like that, can I really give this person absolution? That's a huge debate. It settles that for us. It says, quote, perhaps out of a certain scrupulosity concealed beneath the zeal for fidelity to truth, some priests demand of penitence a purpose of amendment so lacking in nuance, there's our favorite word, that it causes mercy to be obscured by the pursuit of a supposedly pure 
justice. For this reason, it is helpful to recall the teaching of St. John Paul II, who stated that the possible new flaw, quote, should not prejudice the authenticity of the resolution, end quote. So in other words, it's quoting John Paul II, who's noting, because of the possibility of a new fall, because we know the, the husband and wife are probably going to engage in the marital act, you know, pretty soon, even though there might be a, a prior sacramental bond. When I say husband and wife, I'm only talking about civilly. I'm not talking about sacramentally. Um, you know, because you know they're going to fall soon, does that mean they don't have a firm purpose of amendment? No. John Paul II says, that's not the proper understanding of a firm purpose of amendment. Um, for those of y'all who don't know, what, what's a firm purpose of amendment? Well, it's, it's what the words sound like. When you go to confession, I firmly intend to amend my life in this area that I'm confessing. So I intend to not do this sin again. But you can't be so rigid on, on that with, okay, if I might really intend to not do this sin again, but I know in my weakness it's probably going to happen again. Me knowing it's probably going to happen again, does that mean I don't have a firm purpose of amendment? The answer is no. That's important. Because some of these people in these circumstances where they're not living as brother and sister, they're struggling with that, do they have access to the sacrament of confession? Yes, it's saying. They can go to confession and then receive communion. Paragraph 312, Catholics are encouraged to speak to their pastors about their situation, but are to be aware they may not always hear what they want to hear, <laughs> right? So Catholics who are, who are trying to discern, you know, what, what's God's will for their life and, and, and how they're supposed to work through these things, they need to be prepared that they, they are encouraged to speak to their pastors but just be aware, you may not hear what you want to hear. You may hear the repent. You may hear, hey, you have culpability here. You may hear that, hey, you don't have mitigating circumstances. It says, quote, I encourage the faithful who find themselves in complicated situations to speak confidently with their pastors or with other lay people whose lives are committed to the Lord. They may not always encounter and they'll make confirmation of their own ideas or desires, but they will surely receive some light to help them better understand their situation and discover a path to personal growth. All right. So much for Amoris Letizia itself. Now, on to the Buenos Aires Bishops Guidelines. Um, I got a screenshot of it right there in Italian. Uh, the Buenos Aires bishops released some guidelines for their territory. Pope Francis on September 5th, 2016, backed up their guidelines. And he says there's no other interpretations to a more Letizia. So in other words, he's really backing up their guidelines. <laughs> you can see it right there at the bottom. Uh, I don't I don't know Italian, but I know enough to just kind of <laughs> make sense of that. And of course, I've I've, I've done uh, looked up translations and everything, but uh, it's pretty obvious. No he ostras interpretaciones. <laughs> you know, there are no other interpretations is usually how that's translated. Uh, which, again, that's never that's not really in dispute. We all agree that that's what he's saying. So they, the guidelines, they have the proper interpretation. So what are these guidelines? Okay. Well, here's some of the things that they tell us in the guidelines. This is going to be a summary of the entire thing. In the case of those divorced who have not entered a new union, pastors should emphasize the kirgima. That, that, that's the proclamation of the gospel. Divorced who have entered, I'm sorry, divorced who have entered a, 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 a new union, not who have not entered. But those who have, preach the gospel to them. Tell them the truth of the gospel and what Christ expects of them. Tell them the truth of what the church says. Pastors have a duty to do that. Pastoral accompaniment does not necessarily end with receiving the sacraments. It could be in their circumstance that they're not eligible to go to confession and, the, and then the Eucharist until they make certain amendments and changes to their life. And then they can go to confession. 
In some cases, the priest may need to suggest that a couple live in continence. That's again what um, you know, John Paul II was saying, familiaris consortio, 84. In some cases, they, they may need to live as brother and sister. In some cases, they need to split up and the person needs to go back to their original union and they don't need to live as brother and sister. They don't need to be get together at all. For those who fail to maintain this, the sacrament of reconciliation is available to them, obviously, in certain circumstances, right? Mitigating circumstances. Not for all. It could be that in some cases, confession is not available until you make certain changes. In some cases, without a declaration of nullity, that's an annulment, if there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability, especially when a person believes they would incur a subsequent wrong by harming the children of the new union, I gave some scenarios, there may be a possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. Notice that. They talk about both. They don't say access straight to the Eucharist. They never say that. Amor Satitia never says that. They never say that. They say the sacraments of reconciliation. And you, and you might say, well, why is that a big deal? Because, again, some people have this scrupulous understanding of a firm purpose of amendment that would say these people can't even go to reconciliation until they, you know, split apart. That's why. But notice, again, it's saying the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. This is for the purpose of disposing them to mature and grow in the power of grace. This should not be understood as an unlimited access to the sacraments, by the way. All right. It continues. One should use the examination of conscience and amor satitia to further examine their level of culpability, which again is very helpful because it's it's having people ask questions did i in my union did i do something to in this and and not take care of the children of this union and you know it's it's asking some really good questions they're proposing that you go over that examination of conscience and find out if you have sin scandal should be avoided where there are unresolved injustices, providing access to sacraments is particularly scandalous. With certain injustices against a former spouse, giving them access to the sacraments could be scandalous. That should be avoided. All scandal should be avoided. It's careful to note that. Amor Satsitsi is careful to note that. In some cases, access to the sacraments may need to take place privately, obviously to avoid scandal. And here it's, again, talking about uh, reconciliation and the Eucharist. We should avoid creating confusion about the teaching of the church on the indissoluble marriage. They're careful about that. Any, anybody who's trying to create confusion about what the church teaches on indissolubility, they're condemning that. That's wrong. Avoid that. So whatever we're doing here and accompanying people, it can't be in a way that is creating confusion about the indissolubility of marriage. Got to avoid that. <coughs> uh, discernment must remain open to realizing God's ideal through the law of gradualness, which we spoke about earlier, and with confidence in the help of grace. So one must remain open to the ideal, God's ideal for their life, the general principle, the ideal, through the law of gradualness, working towards it step by step, trying to realize that ideal, being confident in God's grace, knowing that God's grace can make that possible. God is not going to require of you something that is impossible. All right, now here's my note on, on, on this. Nothing in the guidelines says the Eucharist should be received without the sacrament of reconciliation. I want to emphasize that. I know I said it before. I'm going to say it again. Nothing in the guidelines says the Eucharist should be received without the sacrament of reconciliation. Nothing. 
Note six from the guidelines says, Amor Satitia offers the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation in the Eucharist. And guess what it references? Footnote 351. The one that everybody tries to use to say, Pope Francis has just changed everything. It actually is saying, no, you have access to the sacrament of reconciliation in the Eucharist, according to footnote 351. Again, why is that a problem? Because some people were saying these people don't even have access to the uh, sacrament of reconciliation because they don't have enough of a firm purpose of amendment. All right. So that's the interpretation. Again, some people will try to use the interpretation of the guidelines here, the, the bishop's guidelines. They'll try to say, um, you know, somehow that this has just opened the door to everything. And, and Pope Francis has denied the gospel and denied the church's teaching. And, and if you look at the guidelines, they're denying it. I just showed you a summary of the guidelines. There's nothing else in there that would say anything different. <clears throat> So the dubia, uh, September 9th, 2016, four cardinals sent a dubia to Pope Francis after a more Tizia was released. What, what is a dubia? It's just a fancy word for a question. And, and so they're putting forth questions, and it's customary for the Pope to uh, respond uh, with a yes or a no. You know, it's, it's not going to be a, uh, a yes, but blah, 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 blah. It's literally yes or no questions. And they presented five questions to the Pope. Cardinal Bramuller, Burke, Kafara, Meisner, the, the last two have passed away. Uh, Bramuller and Burke are still alive. Um, I'll go through the questions real quick. It is asked whether following the affirmations of Amor Satsitsia, it has now become possible to grant absolution in the sacrament of penance and thus to admit to Holy Communion a person who, while bound by a valid mar marital bond, lives together with a different person, more exorio, that, that's as husband and wife, without fulfilling the conditions provided by Familiaris Consortio 84 and subsequently reaffirmed by Reconciliatio Ad Penitentia, blah, 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 blah. Can the expression in certain cases that's found in the 351 of the Exhortation of More Sententia be applied to divorced persons who are in a new union and who continue to live more exorio? Uh, again, I'll... I'll um, I'll uh, go over the the answers to this here, but I just I was just reading them uh, first. Uh, question two: After the publication of the postnotal exhortation on Mor Satitia, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor seventy nine, based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the Church, on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts and that are binding without exception? That's question two. Question three, after a morsetitia, is it still possible to affirm that a person who habitually lives in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, as for instance, that the one that prohibits adultery, Matthew 19, three through nine, finds him or herself in an objective situation of grave habitual sin? Question four, after the affirmations of Amor Satitia on the circumstances which mitigate moral responsibility, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor 81 based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church, according to which circumstances or intentions can never transform an act intrinsically evil by virtue of its object into an act subjectively good or defensible as a choice? And last question. After a more sentencia, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor 56 based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church that excludes a creative interpretation of the role of conscience and that emphasizes that conscience can never be authorized to legitimate exceptions to absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts by virtue of their object? Oh, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Pretty, pretty technical stuff, right? Did Pope Francis answer the dubia? I'm going to leave you in suspense here. I'm going to take a quick uh, five-minute break, get me some more coffee, stretch my legs, and we will continue because I still have uh, about 20 more slides. So give me about five minutes here, and I will be right back, and we'll continue in just a moment. Hang tight.
if you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.
All right. <clears throat> Got my coffee here, and I was able to quickly look it up, as I suspected. Uh, that discussion that I was having briefly with Dr. DeClue, um, I, I I noted how sin is, is what would be an impediment uh, for receiving Holy Communion, uh, necessarily grave matter. Uh, grave sin is defined as not only the existence of grave matter, but also full knowledge and full consent. In those cases, grave matter, full knowledge, consent, all that, yeah, you, you can't receive the Eucharist. But um, uh, with the presence of somebody who did something that is grave matter, but did not have full knowledge and full consent, um, I have not seen it confirmed that they cannot go to the Eucharist. Uh, certainly, they need to go to confession as soon as possible, but question is if they had the opportunity to receive communion prior to confession could they in those uh, circumstances i have not seen anything otherwise because the code of canon law talks about how the obligation here is for those who have committed grave sin not again grave matter <coughs> so unless you've found something otherwise um i'd like to know please correct me but i have not seen that it seems the way I read code of canon law. It's different. But then again, I'm not a professional, so maybe there's a canon lawyer watching who can uh, show me something different here. Uh, but I've never heard of that, never seen that. But again, I could be mistaken. Um, but that being the case, even if I'm mistaken here, none of what I'm presenting on Amor Satitia in, in this presentation really hinges on that because, as we saw, Amor Satitia in the Buenos Aires document itself never says you can go straight to even with mitigating circumstances you can go straight to the eucharist it always recommends that you go first to sacrament of reconciliation and then the eucharist so even if i'm wrong here which i don't think i am but even if i am and you can demonstrate that not doesn't matter because amor satitia and the buenos Aires guidelines aren't saying that anyway so um okay uh so let's continue here Okay. <laughs> Did Pope Francis answer the Nubia? <laughs> well, not directly. <laughs> Should he have? Probably. I'm of the opinion, yeah. Now, it could be that there's some uh, information that Pope Francis is aware of behind the scenes that made him say, look, I, I, I shouldn't answer this. And okay, that's that's fair. Maybe maybe Pope Francis does know something we don't know. And there's there's a reason why he didn't answer it. And he has a he has a legitimate reason. That's possible. I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. That's why I kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say. Yeah, I'm, you know, I kind of lean to. Yeah, I say probably. But I, I totally recognize that there could be some something that he's aware of that you know made him say okay this wouldn't be the best move but at the worst uh worst case scenario this would be a bad prudential decision on his part uh so at the worst um yeah maybe he should have directly answered it uh has he indirectly answered him i think he has i think so um but <clears throat> maybe it should have been more direct it's suggested by some, David Armstrong among others, that in Let Us Dream, The Path to a Better Future, pages 87 89, the Pope provides an answer saying, There was no need to change the church or to change church law, only how it was applied. So that, that kind of indirectly answers the, um, you know, most of the questions there from the dubia. So some are going to argue, like again, David Armstrong, that it's it's kind of been answered implicitly. And also in the Buenos Aires guidelines, it's kind of been answered indirectly. Um, okay, fair enough. Might we still argue that we need a direct answer there? Perhaps, unless Pope Francis is aware of something that we're not, which is certainly possible. However, we got Dr. Robert Fastigi who answers the dubia. <laughs> I think he answered him well, so I'm going to just repeat his answers here. Um. <clears throat> Everything that I'm going to um, quote to you comes from this source, an article by um, uh, Dr. Robert Fastigi online responding to the five dubia from Amor Satitia itself. It's at La Stampa. Um, 
you know, at the bottom of the screen there. So everything that you're going to see here quoted, you know, in quotes in this section is all coming from that article. All right. It's asked whether following the affirmations of Amor Satitia, it has now become possible to grant absolution in the sacrament of penance and thus to admit to Holy Communion a person who, while being bound by a valid marital, I'm sorry, by a valid marital bond, lived together with a different person more more exorio without fulfilling the conditions provided for by familiaris, familiaris consortio and sub, subsequently reaffirmed by reconciliatio et Metensia 34 and Sacramentum Caritatis 29. Can the expression in certain cases found in the note 351 of the exhortation of Morsatitia be applied to divorced persons who are in a new union and who continue to live as husband and wife? Okay. He's going to give an answer. So here it is. Answer. In principle, no. In Amor Satitia, there are no changes in regard to the requirement of priests and penitents with respect to the sacrament of penance. In Amor Satitia 3, Pope Francis indicates that the exhortation does not represent an intervention on the part of the magisterium to introduce new teachings on doctrinal, moral, or pastoral issues. Nowhere in Amor Satitia does Pope Francis give explicit permission for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics to receive Holy Communion who are not observing continence. Uh, the, certain, the certain cases in footnote 351 would seem to apply to special situations where there is moral certainty that the prior bond was invalid, but there are no proofs available to demonstrate this invalidity. In such cases, the discernment of a priest confessor is needed who must take responsibility before God for any counsel given to the divorced and remarried Catholic, any access to Holy Communion must be in a reserve manner to avoid scandal. I would agree with the vast majority of that. I, I would just say that um, my comment here, I, I would say it's certainly true that one of the cases is someone who believes their previous marriage was invalid and has a moral certitude. That, that's certainly true that it is talking about those people, but I'm, I'm not so sure that it's only limited to them. Uh, but I would say, but other circumstances, such as the ones I mentioned earlier, may also be intended. In all of these cases, they're in the context of someone who does not have full knowledge or full consent of the will. So, yes, they can be given absolution and admitted to Holy Communion if mitigating factors are present. So that, that's my take on it. Not too far from Fastigi. I would just add that caveat. Um, so, again, the question, the second question, after the publication of the post-synodal exhortation, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of St. John Paul II's encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, 79, based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church, on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts and that are binding without exception? Fastigi answers, yes. In Amor Satitia 304, Pope Francis makes it clear that general rules set forth a good that can never be disregarded or neglected. That's a direct quote. In Amor Satitia 311, he also reaffirms the need to uphold the integrity of the church's moral teaching. That's also a quote. And to give special care to emphasize and encourage the highest and most central values of the gospel. End quote. Um, my comment here. Absolute moral norms may be binding without exception, but that doesn't address whether there could be reduction in one's culpability or situations where there are also other moral norms to consider. Uh, let's see here. Um, and, and fair enough, Mike Lewis. He says, I think Fastigi was a little late to the game on mitigating factors. He would probably agree with you now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. But I just, you know, I don't know for sure. So I, I'm just adding my take. In addition to what he's saying, I, I had my take here as well. So. Uh, let's see. I think we're on third question, right? After a Mosa Titia 301, is it still possible to affirm that a person uh, who habitually lives in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, as for instance, the one who that prohibits adultery, Matthew 19, 3 through 9, finds him or herself in an objective situation of grave habitual sin? Fastigi, yes. Pope Francis makes it clear in Amor Satitia 301 that the demands of the gospel are not being compromised. Instead, he's merely pointing out that in some cases there are mitigating factors that might affect culpability, which is something affirmed already in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, 
So fourth question, after the affirmations of Omar said Sitia 302 on circumstances which mitigate more responsibility, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splitter 81 based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church according to which circumstances or intentions can never transform an act intrinsically evil by virtue of its object into an act subjectively good or defensible as a choice? Fastigi, yes. Pope Francis never says that circumstances or intentions ever transform an intrinsically evil act into a good and defensible choice. Certainly, that's accurate. He merely acknowledges that pa pastors of souls need to exercise discernment in judging the culpability of people in different situations. Absolutely. He's, he's never saying that, you know, something that's intrinsically evil is no longer intrinsically evil. All right, question five. After a more satitia, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor 56 based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church that excludes a creative interpretation of the role of conscience and that emphasizes that conscience can never be authorized to legitimate exceptions to absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts by virtue of their object? Answer. Yes, and a more Satitia 303. Pope Francis never gives permission to engage in intrinsically evil acts. He merely points out that conscience can recognize that God is calling someone to make an offering or sacrifice that moves in the direction of the good, even if it is not yet what is fully expected. Again, that law of gradualness. And a more Satitia 305. He notes such small steps in the right direction are often more pleasing to God than a life that appears outwardly in order, but moves through the day without confronting great difficulties. So, well, Francis may not have directly answered him, but I, I think uh, Fastigi, uh, I, I think what he offers there is, is a good explanation of, uh, of the dubia. Now, shifting gears. The Council of Trent on Indissolubility. You'll find out why I'm going over this here, but you'll find out towards the end. But I promise this is something you want to stick around for. This is very important. Council of Trent on the marriage, I'm sorry, indissolubility of the uh, sacrament of marriage. Session 4, 10 and 7. Here's what it says. Quote, If anyone saith that the church has erred, full stop. I'm going to finish the quote here in a moment. Pay attention to the way it's worded. Canons are carefully worded. Carefully worded. So that they're condemning something very, 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 very specific. And there's an intention behind the way this is worded, which we'll discuss in a moment. You need to pay attention to the very first part. If anyone saith that the church has erred, in that she has taught and doth teach in accordance with evangelical and apostolic doctrine that the bond of matrimony cannot be dissolved on account of the adultery of the one of one of the married parties and that both or even the innocent one who gave not occasion to adultery cannot contract another marriage during the lifetime of the other and that he is guilty of adultery who having put away the adulteress shall take another wife as also she who having put away the adulterer shall take another husband, let him be anathema. But notice that very beginning part, if anyone saith that the church has erred when it says, and it goes on to say all that, those people are anathema. Well, what's going on here? The council was addressing Luther, that is Martin Luther's claim, that the church does not have the competency to decide on this issue. Luther was saying the church does not have the competency to make claims about divorce and remarriage and the morality of it. It's not competent to do that. It's not able to do that. It does not have that authority. Luther was saying that. He's saying the church is erred when it says, and the reason why it errs is because it doesn't have that competency. 
So the canon is strictly looking at Luther and saying, you're wrong. You're anathema if you say the church has erred when it says, you can't say the church errs because it does have that competency to decide these things. Let's continue. Again, the anathema pertains to those who say the church has erred in saying marriage after divorce is adultery since she has no authority to make this claim. The target was specifically Luther. C. Piet Franzen, Divorce on the Ground of Adultery, the Council of Trent, in the Future of Marriage as institute, uh, Institution. I recommend everybody read it. It's only about 10, 10 pages. Uh, but it's really essential reading for this area. Uh, and Franzen notes that in um, page 92. So everything that I'm going to quote when I say see Franz, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that article there. He dedicated his life, basically, uh, to, the, to the question of Canon 7. I, I want to say that may have been even his thesis, his doctoral thesis. I, I'd have to go back and look, but it was certainly something he focused on. All right, so this means the anathema is targeted at those who deny the church's authority, not those who deny the proposition that marriage after divorce is adultery. Get that distinction in mind. It's targeting those who say the church doesn't have this authority to say that. So it's aired. It's not targeting those who say that, you know, math, marriage after divorce is adultery. It, it's not talking about that question specifically. It's talking about does the church have the competency to say this? Those are the people that are anathematized that would say no. It's not settling the question of divorce and remarriage per se. Might it still be true that marriage after divorce is adultery? Yes. But not on the basis of this canon. We might actually just appeal to something else that the church has said, sure, that's fine. I think, I think you can prove that. I, I think you can prove it's dogmatic in the Catholic Church that um, marriage after divorce in the case of adultery is still... Uh, is still itself adultery because that marital bond uh, is indissoluble. I, I think you can still substantiate that even without this canon. But the purpose of this canon is not to prove that. The purpose of this canon is to say that you're wrong to say the church errs when it says this. That's the way this canon works. Now, many of the Tridentine fathers were aware of several church fathers that did not believe marriage after divorce was adultery. Some of them believed that it sometimes was adultery, sometimes it wasn't in certain cases, and maybe it was for the female but not the male. And so you don't have a consensus of the church fathers, well, at least a universal consensus here. I should emphasize a unanimous consensus. You have some church fathers that did not maintain this. So they did not believe in this indissolubility of the sacrament of marriage. Not, not all of them, at least. Some of them did not. So, several of the council fathers here at the Council of Trent, knowing that, they proposed that there wouldn't be a canon that talks about this. Instead, they wanted a decree that would simply say marriage after divorce would not be permitted. And the reason why is they didn't want to can condemn the council father. I mean, the church fathers. These church fathers that did not believe in the indissolubility of the sacrament of marriage, they didn't want to condemn them. So they're like, okay, you know, I don't know if we should use the canon here. Maybe we should just put in the decree somewhere that, you know, it's not permitted by the church. So that way we're not anathematizing church fathers here. Um, so that also did factor into the council fathers kind of reworking how the canon is going to be worded. It was worded differently at first, and then they continue to work through how they're going to word it. And then you have the Venetian delegation that demanded that the canon on marriage be redrafted so that the fathers of the church and, and, the Eastern Church would not fall under the excommunication of the anathema. So some of their concerns were, look, some of these, uh, this canon, the way it's worded, would condemn the Church Fathers, or some of them at least, and it will also condemn the Eastern practice of divorce and remarriage. 
so the Venetian delegation at the Council of Trent was like, look, we need to we need to reword this so we're not targeting the Eastern Church here. Um, this is a quote from Franzen. In order to follow the Venetian argument, one must understand the peculiar symbiosis which marked the relations between the Latin and Greek communities and the territories ruled by Venice, particularly on the island of the Mediterranean. The local bishops were usually Venetians of the Latin Rite, but their clergy were largely Orthodox and under the authority of a protopapas, which is an archpriest. And it, it was an Orthodox archpriest, by the way. So you have Latin bishops there, but the clergy under the bishop were actually Orthodox. Practicing Orthodox traditions. The Orthodox rite, ritus, which is more than just the liturgy at that time, by the way. It's, it's the customs, including divorce and remarriage. The clergy were allowed to seek ordination from Orthodox bishops on the continent as long as they obtained uh, litere dismissioralis, which is uh, dismissal, dismissorial letters from the Latin bishops. The bishops only stipulated that three times a year all the people should publicly recognize the authority of the Pope by the recitation of the so-called laudis. It was also brought up at the council that the union with the Greeks at the Council of Florence, so back when you had the reunion Council of Florence between Catholics and Orthodox, the Council of Florence document that decreed or proclaimed the union between Catholics and the Greeks, that's Eastern Orthodox, did not require the Orthodox to repudiate their position on divorce and remarriage. Now, it was something the Pope wanted, and he tried to get it after the reunion, though he didn't get it. Uh, so it was certainly something he wanted, but it was not in the decree, and it was not required for reconciliation. So they didn't say, look, you have to repudiate your, um, your understanding of divorce and remarriage in order to enter back into communion with Rome. Now, for the Armenians, I think they actually did require that. Um, actually, they at least required that they would affirm that in the case of adultery, there could be a uh, separation of bed and um, and uh, board, I think. So they were a little bit more strict with the Armenians. Um, but with the Greeks, no, there, there wasn't that language at all, though it was certainly something the Pope wanted for the reunion. Um, so the point here is the Orthodox position was that the divorce and was that divorce and remarriage is not the ideal, but it could be tolerated in some cases, such as adultery. Um, this is the concept known as oikonomia or economia. You can say, pronounce it or spell it either way. Um, and they're basing it on Matthew 19.9 which says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Excuse me. Um, so there's a whole debate on that, the word behind sexual immorality there. I think the Greek word is pornea. There's a whole debate on what does that mean, right? Does that mean adultery? Does that mean incest? Um Again, there's a big debate here. Not all the fathers read it the same way. The, the Orthodox generally read it as um, adultery or something along those lines. So they would say, okay, if you have a prior marital bond, um, div divorce and remarriage, that's not the ideal, um, but we can tolerate it uh, by way of oikonomia. That is, we recognize human weakness, and so we tolerate it in this case, and so they can enter into a second union by way of toleration, not as it's the ideal, but we're just merely tolerating it. And yes, these individuals, after a period of time of penance, in some cases, could receive um, Holy Communion, even though they're in this second uh, marriage and engaging in the marital act. That's the Greek practice. Again, um, Florence did not require the Greeks to uh, repudiate that in order to come back into communion with Rome. Again, it may have been something the Pope wanted, but they did not require that. <clears throat> All right. So, did the anathema here, 
in Canon 7 apply to the Orthodox? Franzen demonstrates no. Luther was specifically targeted, not the Orthodox. They were specifically not targeted here. There's a quote here uh, from Franz, and there is not the slightest doubt that Trent accepted the proposal of the Venetians who def definitely wanted to avoid an excommunication of the Easterns and a possible threat to the fragile and rather superficial ecclesiastical unity which existed in their territories in the East. By the way, those of y'all who want to study the history of communicatio and sacris and sharing sacraments with the Orthodox, you need to look into that. There you have pre preconciliar prior to Vatican II instances of that. Uh, there's plenty more, by the way. Uh, but here's another quote. A protest by a bishop or a group of bishops or delegates is only recorded in the Acts when the legates, that's the papal legates, and the council agree with it. This happened with the statement of the bishops of Cyprus that the Eastern Christians should not sh or should be allowed to live according to their rights. It's important because the right here is not just a liturgical right. The way right was used at the time of Trent was Ritsus was more than just a liturgical thing. It was the way of life. It was the traditions, including divorce and remarriage, not as the ideal, but as something that can be tolerated. Whenever some protested at the Council of Trent and said, look, wait, the way we have the canon phrased right now, we're condemning the Greeks. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to condemn the Orthodox here for this practice. So we're going to rephrase the canon so that Luther only is the one that's targeted and not the Eastern Orthodox. We might think the Eastern Orthodox are wrong. We, not, we might not agree with them, but we're not going to condemn them because we're going to tolerate what they're doing. E. Christian Brugger's view on Canon 7 backs this up. It's a little different than Franzen's view, but it effectively says the same thing. Uh, by the way, this is from the description of this book. <laughs> I'm not using the description as if that's somehow dogma, but what I'm saying is I think the description actually summarizes the book very well, but I am going to actually quote from the book here in just a second. But again, because I think the description of the book um, actually condenses and summarizes the book very, very well. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, and I have had him on the show, by the way, and we did talk about this very question. All right, so it says, quote, the indissolubility of marriage and the Council of Trent begins by laying out the fundamental questions addressed by Trent, the ambiguities of Canon 7, full stop. They're recognizing that, yeah, Canon 7 is phrased ambiguously, and that's deliberate. Talk about Vatican II being amb ambiguous, yeah, well, you need the same the same thing about the Council of Trent. This is why I always say that. You ever listen to me talk about Vatican II? I say, if you want to criticize Vatican II for being ambiguous, do the same thing to the Council of Nicaea. Do the same thing to Constantinople I. Do the same thing to Ephesus. Do the same thing to Florence. Do the same thing to Trent. Why do I say that? Because I have stuff like this in mind. That's what I'm talking about. Canon 7 is deliberately ambiguous. Because they didn't want to condemn the Greeks. But they did want to condemn Luther. So they had to phrase it in such a way that, you know, condemns one and not the other, but it is going to be ambiguous and so. All right. It goes on. In the nature of the interpretive debate that's been underway since the early 17th century, it examines the views on divorce and remarriage of Luther and Calvin as the council fathers would have known them, as well as the beliefs and practices of the Greek churches. Greek here just means Eastern Orthodox. It then undertakes an analysis of the conciliar discussions as recorded in Trent's formal register, the act of, that's the acts of the council, and other primary documents. Brugger further provides an interpretation of the council's final teaching on indissolubility. This interpretation draws attention to subtleties overlooked by most commentators on Trent, and I think that he would say Franzen is one of them. These have either overinterpreted the scope of the council's teaching, arguing that its canons explicitly place the divorce practices of the Greek Christians under an anathema. He says that's wrong. Or they have argued that the council intending no more than to strike the heresies of the Protestants exempted Greeks from divorce from its authoritative promulgations. He takes the position that that's also wrong. So I think he's going to differ a little bit with, with Franz in there. 
But here's what he does say. Drawing on both interpretations, but siding with neither, so he doesn't hold to either one of those positions, Brueger proposes that Trent did indeed dogmatically teach the absolute indissolubility of sacramental marriage while conceding a policy of toleration, but not approval. So toleration, but not approval for Greek divorce for the sake of ecclesial communion between the churches. I think that's a reasonable approach. I, I, I could see that. You know, so I think that there he offers some fair pushback for Franzen's position. Fair enough. I could see somebody taking that thesis. But still note, even if you take Brueger's thesis, he himself recognizes that Trent, they taught the absolute indissolubility of the sacramental marital bond, still tolerated the Greek practice of divorce and remarriage. Interesting. Here's some actual quotes from the book. <clears throat> Page 8 from the introduction. Quote, the legates explained that in certain territories under Venice's political jurisdiction, the majority of inhabitants who are Greek Christians live in singular but fragile unity with the Roman church. The Venetian government permits the Greek archpriest to exercise limited rule over Greek clergy and liturgy, while the Greek inhabitants submit to the loosely defined jurisdiction of the territories Rome appointed bishops and periodically profess acknowledgement of the authority of Rome. And while subject and obedient to Roman authority, the Greeks maintain a most ancient ritus of their fathers, which permits them to dismiss an adulterous wife and marry another, a tradition known to and tolerated by the Roman church. Did you hear that? tolerated by the Roman church. Not accepted, but tolerated. Can you argue the council fathers did not accept that view based on Canon 7? I think so. Probably. Perhaps. Might, might Franz and offer some pushback there? Sure. Might he really latch on to the part about where it's talking about those who say blah, blah, blah. Yeah, sure. But even if you want to take a different approach and say, but no, I think they're still condemning it in the canon. Okay, they're condemning it as far as the teaching, but they're still tolerating this practice. Toleration is not acceptance. I understand that. Toleration is toleration, but toleration is still toleration. I'll show you why that's important in a moment. Uh, publishing an anathema now would burden the Greeks, confuse them, and incite the rebellion against Rome. The delegation entreated the council to moderate the language of the canon to relieve the Greeks of the burden of following, falling under an anathema. So they modify the language so that the Greeks don't fall under the anathema of canon 7. So only Luther falls under it. The Greeks won't. Maybe they don't agree with the Greek practice, but they are going to tolerate it. Page 9, he continues, We see that Trent adopted an indirect formulation for the canon, whereas the prior formulation condemned anyone who says that marriage can be dissolved on account of adultery. The revised formula condemns anyone who says the church errs when it taught and teaches that marriage can be dissolved on account of adultery. So it's, it's modifying that language so that Luther's condemned and the Greeks aren't. Although the, counts, count, ugh, although the council adopted in Canon 5 a direct formulation for its teaching on indissolubility in the cases of heresy, spousal conflict, and spousal absence, it adopted this rare indirect approach for its teaching on divorce in cases of adultery. So he still wants to say, look, it's, it's indirectly condemned in the camp. That decision has generated a 450-year debate over the meaning and scope of Canon 7. <laughs> right. But the purpose still is to point out, my main point here is, whatever they, they thought of the actual doctrine, they still tolerated divorce and remarriage among the Greeks, right? They still tolerated their reception of the sacraments for those who are divorced and remarried, right? Yep. 
They still tolerated it. Maybe they didn't accept it. Maybe they wanted to tolerate it provisionally until the Greeks come around and change. Sure, but they still tolerated it, right? Yep. Okay. Concluding remarks. I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you here in just a second why that's important. Let me give you some overall concluding remarks. Amor Laetitia did not change the teaching of the church. I think I established that. I explained what teaching is, and I demonstrated it upholds the teaching of the church. Nowhere has that changed. Uh, even You can even say, for the most part, the discipline has been upheld. Uh, I, I don't see anything in there with, that would actually really rupture the church's discipline because it nowhere tells them, hey, go and receive the Eucharist without reconciliation. So I don't even think it changed the discipline in the church. Um, which seems to be the, the impression of Pope Francis too. He doesn't think that the teaching or the discipline has changed. So um, the guidelines adopted by Pope Francis does not change the teaching of the church. So the guidelines of Buenos Aires doesn't change the teaching. And I would say it also doesn't change the discipline. The question is, does the discipline contradict the teaching? So whatever discipline that is adopted, which I don't think is substantially different, but even if there's some accidental differences in the discipline, even if there's some accidental differences there, some nuances to it, does it contradict the teaching? No, because first of all, we're talking about a discipline that is for rare cases of people with mitigating circumstances, which obviously reduces the act to a venial sin, avoids scandal, and calls the person to the ideal. So I, I don't see any kind of substantial changes to the discipline here, because they never say again, go on, go to receive the Eucharist and don't go to confession. That's never presented. Um, why a more satitia if there are no changes to the church's teaching or discipline? I mean, like, what, what's the purpose then of doing this? Here's my opinion. Take it or leave it. First of all, to reassert the teachings of the church, which it did do. <clears throat> in a more satitia. Second of all, to once again call people to the ideal, which it did do in a more satitia. To settle the debate on whether absolution can be granted to someone in a new union if they are not always living as brother and sister. Some wondered if this was consistent with a firm purpose of amendment. I think it settled that question. But does that substantially change the discipline? No, I don't think so. Um, but it does settle a debate there because there were some differences on, on this issue. So I, I think that it does make a contribution to the debate here by settling that and saying, even when they're not living as brother and sister in very rare cases, it, it might still be possible that they have enough of an, a, a purpose of amendment to receive the sacrament of reconciliation and then go to the Eucharist. Because some people are saying, no, unless you actually leave that person, you don't have a firm purpose of amendment and I'm not giving you absolution. I would also say a recognition that some have mitigating circumstances, which may temporarily allow them to receive the Eucharist. Of course, we could still say, but it's saying go to confession first. Yeah, sure, that's fine. But it's still noting that there's a reduction there that would allow them to receive the Eucharist anyway, because there's a miti mitigating circumstances in some cases and that would not bar you from the, the Eucharist. Um, as long as they're still working on achieving the ideal standard. So I think it recognizes that. Regardless of the reasons for a more sentencia, those were those were my my suggestions on why a more sentencia. Regardless of the reasons, so take it or leave it. Maybe you have some others. If the Council of Trent tolerated the Orthodox practice of divorce and remarriage in rare cases, and it did, that's beyond dispute. It tolerated, and notice I'm saying tolerated. I'm not saying accepted. I'm not saying it taught it. I'm not saying it wasn't a provisional toleration tolerated tolerated the orthodox practice of divorce and remarriage in rare rare cases if it did that upon what basis can someone criticize the toleration of communion for some in exceptional cases as described in a more sentitia and especially whenever it's saying and confession too so it's not even saying Eucharist without confession. It's saying confession and the Eucharist. That's more than what the council fathers at Trent were doing when they were tolerating the Orthodox, because the Orthodox and divorce and remarriage are not continually going to reconciliation because of their new union. They're not. So you might even say the council fathers were going a step 
further in tolerating that Greek practice than Amor Satitia. So upon what basis are you going to criticize Amor Satitia when the Council of Trent is going further than that? If Amor Satitia's toleration of communion for divorce and remarriage in very rare cases is heretical or evil or whatever criticism people want to offer, might we say the same about the Tridentine Fathers? My point is be consistent. This is why I've always said, if you're going to criticize Amor Satitia, criticize the Council Fathers at Florence, and especially criticize the Council Fathers at Trent. Now, you, you know what? If you're consistent and you, you want to say, I condemn the Council Fathers. They were acting contrary to the gospel. They're condemned. Okay, well, you know what? At least you're consistent, but just be consistent. Don't praise the Council Fathers of the Council of Trent as somehow the standard of orthodoxy while criticizing Amor Satizia. Be consistent. That's all my argument is. If they tolerated it, Upon what basis are you going to say that a more satitia tolerating in rare circumstances uh, is, is somehow evil or contrary to the gospel? Just be consistent. That is the end of my presentation. Much more can be said, as I said. Uh, but I think two hours is certainly sufficient. Two hours and 50 <laughs> slides is, <laughs> is certainly enough. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take some questions for just a few minutes here. So go ahead and put them in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology. VM ask a, uh, asks a good question. Why isn't be consistent in our team name yet? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what... <laughs> he says it way more than dogma and nuance, <laughs> probably. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Just you know, look, you know, be consistent. The, the stuff that I hear people criticize Vatican II for, it's like... I can say the same thing about the Council of Ephesus. Where where are you in, in your crusade against the Council of Ephesus? I've never seen you go on a crusade against Ephesus, but you want to go on a crusade against Vatican too. Do, just be consistent. Um, you know, might, might there be some points of disconnect between the two? Sure, but I, I think the analogy substantially holds. So um, that that's my thing. I think the more you're aware of church history, the more you're aware of, of of things that have happened in the first millennium, the less dogmatic you're going to be about condemning Vatican II or Pope Francis or Amor Satizia or this and that death penalty. It's it's like I, I don't know how you can do that when when you have a really good grasp of some of the things that are taking place in the first millennium. Um, do you think those considered in the first millennium church? Do you think those considered in the first millennium church fathers harmonize on divorce and remarriage? Or does it mean? I don't know if I understand your question correctly. Are you asking me, can the church fathers be harmonized here? Uh, not all of them, no. Um, some would have tolerated divorce and remarriage for uh, a male, but not for a female. Uh, some would have not tolerated it at all. Some would have said that even if your spouse dies, you can't be remarried. <laughs> like, so, I mean, some of them will just. So I, I don't think you have just one consistent view. Um, you you do have some different views there among some of the fathers. And Trent was aware of that. Um, so it was it was trying to not condemn, you know, phrase the canon in a way that would condemn, you know, some of these church fathers. Now, might we argue that some of those were not not really the popular view or dominant view? Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, let's see here. Amazing work, Lofton. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, not doctor yet, but thank you. Um, okay. Uh, one of my biggest concerns with the more Satizia is that it seems imprudent to flesh out nuance in the church teaching at a time in our history when important documents are being challenged. But you also, I understand where you're coming from, but you also have to consider that, but, it, but it's also in this time where you have so much confusion on um, marriage, so much ignorance among people, so many people that are entering into unions not knowing anything about marriage or the church's standard that you have so much more of a need to to be pastoral with people um so i understand where you're coming from but i, I want to say but it's also in light of our current situation uh today that you kind of have this need for this 
Uh, Marie says, wow, we'll listen to that again, especially the Trent position of tolerance. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sanctified says, I can see it now. Be consistent, R&T mug. I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what would you say to an Eastern Orthodox who would say the Trent fathers were cowards who caved because they tolerated the Greek practice? It wasn't that they were cowards. I don't think that logically follows. It's that they realized they, they weren't going to uh, condemn some church fathers and also the Greek practice. They, they wanted to maintain um, a union that they had going on there um, in the Mediterranean and did not want to ruffle those feathers um and so they made the prudential move of of tolerating it uh they're not agreeing with it tolerating it because i don't think the council fathers on the whole agreed with the greek practice i don't i don't think they did uh, but i do know that they tolerated it uh wish we had that except for the case of pornea issue sorted out yeah that that's a curious one right um that, that's certainly a curious one uh but however that thing shakes down um it still doesn't take away from the fact that Trent tolerated it so <laughs> upon what basis do you criticize the more sentencia when i think that the council of trent went a step uh further than um and so did florence a step further than um a more sentencia because again what trent was tolerating is a greek practice that does not require um consistent reconciliation whereas it seems to me that a more sensitive in buenos iris is very careful to know reconciliation eucharist reconciliation eucharist so it, it never says hey just eucharist you you can just go straight to the eucharist though you might argue that one could with mitigating circumstances it still never argues that so um <laughs> What level of teachings do encyclicals generally fall under? Well, I mean, obviously it's going to be under, in the preconciliar area, it's, it's, it's generally going to be called Catholic doctrine, what we would call non-definitive Catholic doctrine or authentic magisterium. There's different terms for it. Merely authentic mag magisterium, I should say. Um, so non-definitive Catholic doctrine, merely authentic, those are appropriate terms. Uh, but there's huge wide range in the weight of merely authentic magisterial teachings. There's a wide range there, so that's a category, but that doesn't address what the weight is in that category. Um, and and rather than ask what what does the document fall in, I would ask what the proposition is, because there there are um, propositions in encyclicals that are definitive. So, um, you know, a pope could repeat something that's definitive in an encyclical. And though you might say the document is non-definitive, that proposition in the document isn't non-definitive. It's definitive. So I don't ask as much what, what's the document. I ask the proposition. You do need to know the document because that does impact weight. Uh, but you need to ask the questions, deeper questions, like what is the weight to this proposition? <laughs> Um, okay. Um, have I seen Pedro Gabriel's new channel on Amoris? I, I've not, I've heard about it, but I've not seen it. Um, so I, I, I can't comment, uh, specifically on it. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you think the effort for pro same sex union groups in the church supporting the pride movement are in line or are frustrating what Amor Sitsitsia uh, is teaching when read in an orthodox manner? When you read Amor Sitsitsia, it's very careful to note that those those are those are unions that would oppose. So it speaks of unions that would contradict the marital standard and those that would only partially fulfill it. Um, I believe that when it's talking about those that contradict it, it's talking about same sex unions. But it's certainly not giving any approbation to these. Um, it constantly calls people who are in less than the ideal to meet the standard of the, uh, the ideal and to repent and to convert. Okay. 
Jack asks, sorry if you covered this, but did Amor Satitia teach that communion can be given to adulterers? Um, Jack, that's literally what we spent two hours on. I can't give you a short answer to that. You need you need to go and watch the the, the two hour presentation. Um, I, w I wish I could answer that one very quickly, but there, there's just too many too many distinctions that need to be made here. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. He says thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> if you you gotta go watch it. That's what that's what I was doing here. So the the whole two hours. <laughs> um, let's see. Cord's work says I buy your reading, but I see why some don't give the folks Francis seems to surround himself with. Oh, I I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Might might we say that there's some valid uh, concerns and, and criticisms of some of the prudential moves he makes here, the people he surrounds himself with? Yeah, maybe. Maybe so. Um, Rusty says, I love how you aren't another Catholic anger, anger peddler or scandal chaser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's see. Alexander says, I was personally surprised by how much I liked Amor Satizia when I first read it, given how controversial it was. Really, only the one problem spot was a downer because I couldn't figure out what it meant. Um, what Are you talking about paragraph 351? Yeah. Go in, go in, I don't know if you watched it, but if you're talking about paragraph 351, I, I address it extensively, so certainly check it out. Um. Tom says, yeah, right, Michael, just torture this man to watch two more hours. Well, I don't think he watched the two hours. That's why I'm telling him to go watch it. <laughs> I, I think he came in at the end of the stream and was asking. So I'm saying, no, go, go watch the whole thing. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> some answers I can give you quickly. Some it takes a two, two hours and a 50, 50 slides to, to answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Some things can be answered like that black and white clear cut some things it takes time to answer and, and some people don't have patience for that um there's somebody uh, online the other day that doesn't like me and was talking about how oh don't ask michael that question it'll take a millennia to answer and i'm just thinking you know it's kind of shallow because some answers require more than 10 seconds you know to to provide there's some thoughts that require more than 120 characters, right? Um, if if you're if you're a deep thinker, you you will recognize that some things can't be answered in 10 seconds. Some things take time. So uh, I try to be brief. Um, I actually really prefer presentations that are brief. But again, unfortunately, some things have to take. You know, they take time to answer. Um, Let's see. Gregory says that was a pretty good presentation. Michael, have you read or watched any of Pedro uh, Gabriel's work on Amores? I know he wrote a book on it, right? Didn't he just write a book on it? I haven't taken his view into consideration. No, I've dealt mostly. Mostly, what I did in preparation for this was the primary documents. Not that you can't benefit from secondary sources. Yes, you can. Uh, you notice that I dipped a little bit into secondary when I got into. Um, Robert Fastigi. But you notice I focus on primary sources the whole, the vast majority of the time. Primary sources. We're going straight to a more sensitivity and we're going to the, then the interpretation of it. Maybe you can call that a secondary source, but I would still label it in a way a primary source. But I can see how somebody would call it a secondary. Um, but <clears throat> you'll notice I went straight to the sources. I'm not focusing on what so-and-so said as much as I am the documents themselves, and then I'll pepper it a little bit with what so-and-so said. Um, again, not knocking secondary sources and what other people said. I just I, I want to focus on the primary sources and then also you know, consider a little bit some secondary sources here as well. Is that, that's also been um tom says well michael i'm not a patient man but i'm learning so much for you uh from you god bless you and your work brother thank you i appreciate it yeah look i understand sometimes we want quick answers i totally get it look i when i read augustine's de trinitate i'm just like get to the point 
get to the point. Just stop it. Just get to the point. You're taking a hundred pages to say something you can say in two pages. Just get to the point. <laughs> when I read Ratzinger, uh, get to the point. Get to the point. Get to the point. You're taking ten pages to say something on one page. Get to the point, Ratzinger. It, you don't need to say this in ten pages. I just need that one page. <laughs> so look, I get it. Sometimes it's like, just come on, come on. <laughs> but some of this stuff, yeah, it, it does need to be fleshed out. Uh, with, with something that can be fairly lengthy. Uh, thank you for the super chat here, Sean Matthew. Um, can a Catholic hold to the view that even though theoretically non-definitive teachings at an ecumenical council can air practically, this will never happen because of high level of an ecumenical council is? So as far as practically, could you hold to that view? Sure, but you, you need to hold to it theoretically because the magisterium itself recognizes that that theoretically could happen. Uh, so you need to at least hold to it conceptually. But if you believe that God God and his providence wouldn't allow for it, uh, okay, well, that's a different question. Um, James interviews, get to the point, laughs in nuance. <laughs> I didn't know you could laugh in nuance. <laughs> uh, would you say that people have a preconceived opinion that a more sentencia contains errors and read into it to find errors? Thank you for your help. Of course, there are plenty of people do that um but we need to be charitable and, and not try to read our interpretations into it but read the document for itself um uh so mega man is telling me this presentation it, it looks like mega man to me i think i think you, i think you told me alexander once that 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 was someone from among us or something or is that mega man i don't know i'm gonna say it's mega man this presentation is super useful as a reference to send people to to now i love your videos but a lot of them are covering lots of various things which makes it hard to simply link yeah i, I hear what you're saying yeah and some some videos like it's i'm trying to kill two birds and one stone so a couple cover multiple things rather than doing multiple streams so i i hear what you're saying i'm trying to get to the point where i'm covering one thing specifically per video so that it's easier to share so i, I hear where you're coming from um do you have videos on what is and what is isn't authoritative and what is and what is an infallible and ecumenical council yeah check out my magisterium playlist or even better than that go to my course on the magisterium at maximusinstitute.com it's called understanding the magisterium and i go over this um yeah jack i've answered this one many many times you're, you're just going to need as far as can a pope teach error or heresy those are two different questions you're going to need to go and uh watch my videos in the magisterium playlist that's just not one i'm going to rehearse here since I've, I've done multiple shows on it it's a good question but we we'll certainly check those out um in fact I, I think i just did something on it yesterday or the day before um okay so i think you are to, su supposed to refrain from communion of grave matter because reconciliation is partly judicial and no one can be a reliable and partial judge in his own case i see what you're saying but that's not that's not what canon law says it, it talks about grave sin and grave sin is not grave matter grave sin is whenever you have grave matter full knowledge and full consent so i see what you're saying um it might it be a good rule to go to confession first yes but is that strictly required canonically i'm arguing no now if you find a canon lawyer that shows otherwise please correct me i'm hoping I'm I'm happy to be corrected. Nothing of what I've presented on No More Satitia today stands or falls on that. So I'm happy to be corrected, and I would like to know just so I know for my own sake and for so I don't give misinformation. But that's not the way I've read the Code of Canon Law. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm not an expert here, so maybe I'm misreading something and not accounting for something. Um, but... I could certainly say in in the in many cases that might be applicable um but in some cases i've seen confessors say no like if you have a teenager who's struggling with self-abuse and his hormones are crazy are you really saying he has to go to confession every single time before the eucharist if if that's the case uh that that might end up becoming um uh end up becoming absurd so 
I could see some confessor saying, okay, come come often, come frequently, but you can still receive communion in, in some cases. So um, might you say that they're abusing it? Okay, but on what basis canonically would you say that? Again, are you? Th could this be a good rule? Sure, but is that absolutely required? I haven't seen evidence for that. And could it not be the case that in some circumstances, the pastor and the individual and their, their confessor, the individual, the penitent and their confessor could discern that there are mitigating circumstances? Yeah, I think that they could. So in those cases, could the confessor say that you don't have to come to confession every day? But so if you're, you're doing daily mass, but you're also struggling with this issue, you don't have to come to confession every day. Just come once a week or come once a month, but you can receive communion in the meantime. I think a confessor could do that unless you can show me that that's excluded uh, canonically. Uh, so I hear where you're coming from, but I, I, I don't see it. But again, if I'm wrong, nothing I've said here really depends. Uh, you know, my case for more sensitivity, it doesn't depend on that. Uh, Sean Matthew, off topic, but if we get an official canonical method, would there be an infallible safety when the church decides to depose a pope? Or can they actually depose an innocent man by accident? Yeah, that, that is a risk, right? So the the question is, would there be a safety? I think there would, because I don't think the, the church is going to promulgate something so central to the church's constitution, which obviously the papacy is going to be involved there as it's part of the church's constitution it's so central to that that i don't think that the holy spirit would allow something that would be devastating there uh so i think that if there were to be a canonical process it would be so airtight that you wouldn't have that kind of case um vm i'm waiting for reviews to come on this one do people ever really review my case or do they just ignore it? it seems to me that they just ignore what i say and just continue to repeat the same things that they say over and over and don't really account for what i'm saying so i, I think it'll just be ignored like most things i do um uh jack says i was looking for a yes or a no <laughs> jack you're killing me <laughs> there's no i can't give you an, a yes or a no and if you go and watch my video you'll see why because there's a huge difference between error and heresy and so i can't give you an, a yes or a no to that uh yes to error no to heresy there's your yes or no but that's not going to make sense to you that that's not going to help you you're going to need a more developed answer to that so go and watch the videos i tell you to watch i promise it'll be profitable <laughs> Yeah, you and I are a lot alike. <laughs> I want a yes or a no answer. <laughs> In some cases, it's just not that that clear. Not that truth is relative, but that there's more things to consider. <laughs> uh, I hear you, though. Anyways, um, I think I grabbed everything, right? Let's see. The playlists are super useful. Yeah, yeah, I use them. Um, VM says, surprised by the lack of rad trad invasion today. Yeah, I'm a little surprised too. Um, Michael, while reading Augusta, why are you so slow? It was exactly right. <laughs> Gosh, you ever read his anti anti Pelagian writings? It's like everything Augusta writes. Come on. I, it, it's, I'm not saying it's bad. It's it's good, but it's just like, gosh, you could say this in, in, in just one sentence. You don't have to take a whole page to say this. But he just circles the barn over and 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 over. Come on, Augustine, get get to it. I guess that was kind of the style that they wrote in that day. But for me, it's just like, man, come on. <laughs> Uh, Via says, Jack, this is RT, not theology kitty hour. <laughs> oh, I mean, I understand where Jack's coming from. Again, I, I, I want answers like that sometimes, but and, and sometimes there are clear cut answers like that. Uh, in some cases, you just have to, there's, there's important distinctions that have to be made. And so, when can we have a theology kitty hour? I don't know. It's just not my thing. Um, I've tried to do videos where just keep it, keep it really basic for newcomers to the faith. And uh, I find that torture to do. I find it a, a huge challenge. I find it very difficult to do something like that. And God bless all the apostolates that are dedicated to, you know, explaining the faith to people who are brand new to the church. God bless those people. 
because I needed that myself when I was brand new. So there, there's a need for that. I needed it. Other people need it. But it's just so hard for me to just like, like some people want me to do a ver, uh, you know, like a video on what's purgatory. They're just basic. Why do Catholics believe purgatory? What? I, <laughs> this, I just, I find that difficult. I find that really hard to do. But again, I see the utility for it. I'm not knocking it. I see, I see the need. But I just, I don't know if that's really going to ever be what RNT is used for. Um, one of the great horrors of this channel is realizing how cringe all your past rants to your friends about the Pope or uh, some such were. Yeah, I mean, that's, was speaking, you're speaking about me too. I've I've been guilty of this, so yeah, I would have disagreed with me uh, a few years ago. So, meanwhile, Michael making presentations. Yeah. Um. Meanwhile, or maybe Augustine flows better in Latin. Maybe I've, I've kind of wondered, like Ratzinger too. You know, I know he he wrote in German. I kind of wonder if if he reads easier in German than in English, because I always feel like the translations that I read are torture. Um, I mean, Ratzinger is he he is rightly one of the greatest theologians of the twentieth century, rightly so. It's like maybe the translations that I'm reading just make it torture. Because I just feel like, you know, I don't know. Then again, I've read some things by Ratzinger that didn't read that way. They were just very, they flowed very well. Uh, case in point, in his book on truth and tolerance, uh, where he's talking about a CC. I didn't feel that was, you know, dragging it out. I thought he was pretty, pretty straightforward in it. Uh, but like his intro to theology, I just felt that that was just, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> way way better writer than I will ever be. So I, I gotta I gotta give him credit. <laughs> uh do I like Newman's writings? Exact same thing with Newman. Exact same problem. I, I just kind of feel like the development of doctrine. I just I mean, I'm not saying it's not amazing. I'm just saying, could we condense some of this? <laughs> Again, maybe it's the translation, not that it's a translation for him, obviously he wrote in English, but maybe it's the form of English that I'm reading. It's just kind of outdated or something in his case. Maybe it's that, perhaps. Uh, say what you want about Patrick Coffin, but his more Letizia Quip is still comedy gold. I have not seen that. I need to check that out. Can you email that to me? Reason at theology at gmail.com. I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, Michael, what about the necessity of a firm purpose of amendment of, for a valid absolution? I did address that in the presentation. How can one have a firm purpose of amendment and not separate from adulterous spouse? That's exactly that's exactly the point I was making. Some people took that view, so Morse Letizia directly addresses that, and it quotes John Paul II to answer that question. So certainly go back and watch the presentation. I did specifically answer that. Um Sean says, don't ask the nuance master to give a non-qualified answer. <laughs> yeah, please don't. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, sometimes it could definitely be blamed on the translator, probably, yeah. Uh, Mike should do a comedy hour reacting to cringy stuff he said back in the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not that I don't have enough material for it. <laughs> I'm growing. I'm still growing. Um, I'm sure I'll continue to develop my theories, but I think what you're going to see from me is developing uh, as far as tweaking. You're not going to see substantially changing my views. Um, I, I don't see that happening. I mean, I'm always open to, to truth. Don't get me wrong. I think I'm um, I'm in the general general area, right? I don't think there's going to be substantial changes. Uh, might there be some tweaking, nuancing to some of my views? Yeah, probably, probably. So I, th I think you can expect that in the years or decades to come as I develop as a apologist and a theologian, especially. Um, I, th I think you can you can expect some 
some tweaking to my theology where maybe in some areas I'm not precise enough. Um, that's certainly the case. Um, okay. Well, um, I think that's roughly it. Augustine is likely better spoken, perhaps. All right, I think I grabbed everything. I uh, appreciate y'all watching. And like I said, share this with people who are confused about Amor Sitsitsia. Perhaps this will help them. Uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, so this will circulate on YouTube more. and more. It'll reach more people. Um, and of course, check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason of theology if you want to support me and you also get access to extra content. And lastly, if you want to learn about the Catholic Magisterium, check out my course, Understanding the Magisterium, at MaximusInstitute.com. All right, see you later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, just a quick word from our sponsor. Be sure to check out realestateforlife.org if you want to sell a home or buy a home and you want to use an agent who shares your perspective about the pro-life cause. Make sure to check them out, realestateforlife.org, to support the pro-life movement and your choice to sell or purchase a home. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, just a quick word about one of our sponsors, Verbum, an excellent Bible and theological software. Go to verbum.com forward slash reason. You'll support what we're doing here at Reason and Theology. You'll also get 10% off any of the packages that you choose, along with five free extra books. Again, verbum.com forward slash reason.